in the heart of Texas, quarterback Jim Kelly continues to pull the strings as maestro of the gambler's run and shoot. Kelly leads the USFL in touchdown passes, yards passing, and completion percentage. In recent weeks, Kelly's favorite targets have been slot backs Richard Johnson and Ricky Sanders. Johnson leads the USFL with 72 receptions, and two weeks ago, he set a league record when he caught four touchdown passes against Portland. Sanders recently returned to the Gamblers lineup after missing eight games with a knee injury. Last week against Memphis, Ricky grabbed 11 passes, including that 43-yarder. Sanders' heroics weren't enough, though. The showboats continually pressured Kelly in a 17-15 upset over the Gamblers. Tonight, Kelly and the rest of his arsenal need a win to keep pace with Oakland. The Bulls must win to stay atop Baltimore for the final playoff position. They used to call this building the eighth wonder of the world, where tonight we're looking forward to an all-new world of offense as the Jacksonville Bulls take on the Gamblers of Houston here in the Astrodome in Houston. Here's the playoff story. Jacksonville, they need a win to hold on to the eighth and final spot. The Baltimore Stars have already put pressure on them by beating Orlando. And, of course, Houston now trying to keep pace with the Oakland Invaders. Lindy and Fani, the head coach of the Jacksonville Bulls. And Jack Pardee, whose club is on the edge of greatness, it appears. He feels confident about his team going into tonight's game. He's glad to be back home. Brian Franco will kick off for the Bulls. Back deep for the Gamblers. Clarence Verdane along with Sean Potts. Picking it up and carrying it out, Calvin Eason. And he's dumped at about the 13-yard line. That's a better start than they had a year ago, Tim. Verdan took the first one back 94 yards, and that's no way to start a football game. Mike Thomas made the stop. Markers down. Obviously, we have some holding on the offense, which will make it even worse for the run and shoot as they make their way out. And they'll start at their seven-yard line. Offensively, Jim Kelly to run the show, as always. His numbers are just awesome. We could go on and on about them. In the backfield, Todd Fowler. The slot backs will be Verdane and Johnson. The wide receivers, Vince Corville, along with Scott McGee, will set the front line for you in just a moment. Gerald McNeil goes to the top of your screen, starting in Corville's spot. Johnson in motion. Scott McGee comes up with it at the 13-yard line. Rodney McMillan made the stop for Jacksonville. Defensively for the Bulls, they'll run with a three-man line at times. Bob Nelson, the nose tackle. Keith Millard and Bob Clasby will be the ends. The running backs are the linebackers, Tom Dinkle, Terry Beeson, Vaughn Johnson, and Joe Costello. The secondary has Van Jakes and Donald Dykes at the corners. Joe Johnson and Chester G are the safeties. Second down, just a yard to go with the ball spotted at the 16. Fowler, close to the yardage necessary for the first down. They do give him the first down. Fowler had a difficult time in that Memphis game. You might recall he's the guy that fumbled on a fourth down play at, that cost the gamblers, trying to shake that off. But he's posted some good numbers in his day as the lone setback, along with Sam Harrell at times out of East Carolina. As a matter of fact, it was due to Harrell's injury that Fowler got his opportunity to start. Since then, he's been right there. And he'll be in Dallas next year playing with a star on the side of his helmet instead of a G. <laughs> First and 10 at the 17. Johnson's got it. Van Jakes made the stop. First down for the Gamblers. We talked about Jimmy Johnson, the defensive coordinator, and what he would do to stop the run and shoot. Here he runs zone defense, a three-man line, and runs zone. And if you don't get to Kelly, when you run zone, 
the crossing patterns by the slot backs are wide open because they get between the defensive backs and the linebackers. And you saw the graphic picture of it. Johnson wide open in between the scenes. Billy Kidd is the center. Tommy Robinson along with Rick Kerr are the guards. It tackles Rob Taylor and Chris, Chris Ream. Sanders is in motion. Horrible's got it. Jakes, along with Joe Johnson, were there to sandwich him. That was Vince Corville with the reception. Corville going to see a lot of action tonight. One, because Gerald McNeil's got a little bruise on the thigh. Again, they're playing zone defense. And, folks, you can see they got in between the cornerback and the safety. And if you're going to run, whoa, look at that pop out there. Well, the ball can't be caused. The fumble can't be caused by the ground. So he gave it to him right at the 30-yard line. Harrell is in the game, the lone setback now. No play action. Sanders. Johnson made the stop. Sanders coming off that knee injury. You know, you get the feeling that this club is very, very good, but how much better could they have been without the injuries, such as in the case of Sanders? Well, Sanders, from what I understand, from all the coaches at Houston say, he is the best athlete of all the receivers. He caught 108 last year, which is a rookie receiving record in any league on any planet, and uh, he's really been a fine, and it hurt him. Absolutely. He caught 11 in the first game, and then he was out for the rest of the time. Second and two with the ball of the 22 of Jacksonville. So many people that they can give it to in the skilled areas. Vaughn Johnson, the inside linebacker out of North Carolina State, was able to run him out of bounds. And Timmy, the big thing about all of their skilled people is they just line them up and anybody that can't run 4-4 gets his ticket back home. <laughs> and when you get a kid like that in the open field, it makes defensive corners and safeties knees shake. They can run right by. Would you have been mean and lean in this offense? Oh yeah, sure. With my speed, 4-7 if I was lucky. <laughs> Dane in motion. Morell is stopped in his tracks. Bob Clasby in his second year out of Notre Dame, among others, were in on the stop along with Terry Beeson. Beeson, a second round draft choice in 77 with Seattle. Played a few years there. Field goal time because they did not pick up the first down on that running play. And the fans are a little upset about the fact that Tony Frisch is coming out to add to his point total. But Tony's not mad. He's in a big battle for that uh, scoring leader who gets a free car for a year. Tony says, I got no wheels unless I win. <laughs> Tony's a good man. He got all those points last year, you might recall. Apparently, they don't have enough guys on the field. Tommy Myers, the holder, calls timeout. Or perhaps they're going to think about it for a while. We'll tell you the situation when we return. It's tied at not a right. The decision here is not so much for the offense and their emotion, but if you allow Jacksonville's defense to think that you've got a leg up on the run and shoot, then you've got a problem. And I've, I've, I admire the coach for going for the first down here. He should do it or else Jacksonville gets the emotional edge. Fowler, first down. The key on this play is Tommy Robinson, number 70, Billy Kidd, 61, and 74, Rick Kerr. The two guards and the center, they've got to win the battle at the line of scrimmage. When you've got a guy the size of Todd Fowler, all you have to do is give him an inch. He'll get the three feet that you need for the first down. He's a big boy. Remember, he's running still with that brace on his knee. He had the bad knee injury in preseason, and that slowed him down this season. He's not quite as effective. Horrible at the bottom of your screen. First and 10, Houston, now at the 18 of Jacksonville. Picked off inside the 10 by Ronnie McMillan. Rodney McMillan comes up with the interception. Vaughn Johnson, the linebacker, tipped it. The key on this play is the tip. Watch when Kelly, he's got his read, he's got a man wide open. And it was 
Johnson 22 but the tip made the difference and that's the way to stop it. Von Johnson 33 the linebacker got the tip. And I'll tell you what the coaches teach put your hands up put your hands up put your hands up and guess what happens that old tip drill that you work on every day in practice comes through with an interception and a turnover and that's a big turnover for these guys. 918 is left. Jim Brando and Mike Hafner with you here on ESPN our Monday night game and it's a dandy. Nothing nothing right now with the Bulls at their five. Mike Mitchell made the stop of Perry Kemp. Jacksonville offensively has Jay Pennison at center, Gary Anderson and J.T. Turner are the guards. The tackles are Bob Gruber and A.V. Richards. The tight end is Mark Keel. The split end is Perry Kemp. The wide receiver to the opposite side is Alton Alexis. Sight the quarterback with running back Larry Mason and fullback Mike Rozier. Tim, if they had Luther at quarterback, he wouldn't have thrown on first down, but with the veteran in their sight, he's not afraid to throw it, that being Lindy and Tony. Second and seven from the nine. <laughs> Rozier felt it. Rayford Cooks, along with Hosea Taylor, in on the stop. Defensively, the gamblers look this way with a four-man line. Rayford Cooks and Pete Caton are the ends. Van Hughes and Hosea Taylor are the tackles. The linebackers, Mike Hawkins, brother Andy Hawkins, and inside is Kiki Diella. Sight. Plenty of time. Oh, he just threw that one away. And Hughes gave Sype a great deal of pressure. A lot of pressure on Sype late, though he just didn't have any receivers open. Here's the old veteran. He can feel the pressure all over the place, and you know what he does. He throws it up in the nickel seats so that you don't get called for intentional grounding. They can never call it when you throw it out of bounds. And a rookie quarterback will try to stick it in, get it picked off, give up bad field position. Now they get to punt it away and at least make Houston go 50 yards. Larry Swider will punt it away. Back deep, Gerald McNeil. He's standing around midfield for the gamblers. trajectory McNeil can do something with this one the 40 there he goes he'll make it all the way for the touchdown teams had been a question mark defensively for Jacksonville it was evidence right here you match artificial turf and 4-4 speed and you get a 50 yard punt return for a touchdown nobody touches it it's just flat out speed look at the people go by it's like a whoosh as he goes by Gerald McNeil 49 yards touchdown and he did it purely on speed they didn't block a soul Frisch for the extra point. Take a look at it if, as if you were covering or watching as he takes it downfield. We take it from the end zone, and you'll see that really nobody makes, well, there's one block right there, but the rest of it is just flat out speed. And it looks like the team in the white was standing still. The guy in the black disappeared. The special teams, not the run and shoot, are shooting up the score in Houston. 7 nothing now. Well, that should be a great game you see here on ESPN. Oakland against Denver. Oakland had to come from behind to win over the weekend. Denver is still a very hot club. Frank Corral will kick off. He put it into the end zone, too, didn't he? Dale Walters had been the kicker for the Gamblers, and... He had trouble getting it into the end zone, and they couldn't let Frisch go. I mean, after all, he's Mr. Houston in the kicking fraternity, so... But Tony can't Corral. kick off. Tony can't kick off, so they needed a punter who could kick off, and Frank Corral has punt, yep. kicked off, kick field goals, and extra points, so he's a great insurance for Tony, and he's not a bad punter. 
And besides, Tony knows all the good places to eat. That's right. <laughs> and you can tell by the way he wears his uniform. We know because he sent us to the best restaurant in town just last night. First and 10 at the 20 for Jacksonville. They'll throw by seven right now. Not much room for Rozier. Tommy Myers was coming up defensively. Andy Hawkins, the linebacker, and Pete Caton also in on the action. Mike Rozier is an inside runner, Tim. He's got the great quick feet. He surprised everybody with his hands, but he really doesn't have the great speed to run the sweep outside. And you can see here that Houston strings it out, and Rozier's got no place to go. But I like to see him running inside the tackles rather than around the ends. And also, the veteran Sipe should use him out of the backfield as a pass receiver. Uh, most Nebraska tailbacks don't get to catch the ball very much in their career, but he's turned out to be a good one. Second down and nine at the 19 after the loss of one. <laughs> Incomplete intended for tight end Mark Keel. Andy Hawkins, the linebacker there, to provide coverage for Houston. A lot of pressure coming from Van Hughes on site. In, in Lindy and Fonny's offense, and you see Sipes' uh, stats there so far, you've got to gain yards on each down, and significant yards, three, four. You don't ever want to get Sipe and his offense into a third and long situation. They don't have the great deep speed. They don't have the outside back to get the big yardage, and it always puts a lot more pressure on Sipe because he's not that mobile anymore. The rest of that secondary for Houston, Mike Mitchell and Will Lewis are the corners. Tommy Myers and Luther Bradley, a couple of five safeties in that secondary for Jack Pardee. Third and 11. Kemp, first down. Bradley there to make the stop. Nice pattern run by Harry Kemp out of California State in his third season. And a great read by the veteran Brian Seif. He gets time, first of all. Now watch the inside move. And that's the key for Kemp. He's got to get on the inside shoulder. And Sight sees him break, and he sees Tommy Myers, 37, come up to make the play. And he picks it right in between them. An outstanding read by the quarterback and a good catch by Kemp in traffic. You start talking about guys like Tommy Myers, the true scrap iron of <laughs> oh, yeah. professional football in his 13th season, all those many years with the New Orleans Saints. First down and 10 with the ball at the 39. Jacksonville trailing by seven. Rozier has room for the first time. Not a lot of room, but some room. He gets four yards. Andy Hawkins, the linebacker, along with Pete Caton out of Eastern Illinois, making the stop for the gambler. That's where I like to see Rozier run the football. And he got four yards on first down. Now you put the Houston Gambler defense in a sweat. It's second and six. You can run or throw. If you run, only get three yards. It's then third and two or third and three, but you can also throw the football, and if you're not playing run, you can pick up big yardage. Mason has come out of the game. An extra wide receiver has been brought in. That guy is Aubrey Matthews in a slot to the top of your screen. The delay to Rozier. Finally horse collared by Luther Bradley inside the gambler territory at the 42. When Rozier is in the backfield, you don't know if he's coming out to catch a pass. It's second down and six. You got the defense in a sweat. Here they run a draw play, and the key to this draw play is that Luther Bradley makes the tackle. You know what happened? Mike Hawkins was playing pass first, and so he's taking the deep drop, and when he comes running right at you, you're in trouble. Watch Keel on this block. Nice turn there. Keel the tight end right on Hawkins, and if you're playing pass first, Tim, you haven't got a chance against a great back like Rozier. First and ten. The Bulls in the midst of a drive here after the punt return. Mason stacked up. The play was forced nicely by Keaton, and then Rayford Cooks polished up the other defensive end to make the stop. They're again trying to run wide on the speed of the Houston Gambler defense. You can't do it, Tim. You have to do it every once in a while to keep the defense honest. But if you try to use it for your bread and butter play, you're going to find yourself in second and 11 a lot of times. Brian Seip, a very personable guy. The first thing he did when he came to Jacksonville was put together some promotional announcements that ran on Jacksonville television stations, saying, I'm glad to be out of Jersey and here in the 
Sunshine State and ready to play football for you. He'll do anything they ask of him. Rozier. Hosea Taylor got him in his tracks. The homespun star that played his football for Billy Yeoman at Houston. Lindy Infante is a Paul Brown disciple, although I don't think Lindy would admit it. But if you'll remember, Paul Brown was famous for the draw play. Second and long, third and long, Paul Brown's teams always ran the draw. Or at least they ran it quite a lot more often than most offensive teams. And Lindy had some exposure to that Cincinnati philosophy on offense. A few other guys, too. Bill Walsh at San Francisco, he's fairly successful. Third down and 11. Alexis in the slot. Sipe has plenty of time. Lines up, finds Kemp. Will they mark him in the end zone or just shy? Just shy. He tried to do the pirouette act. What a great catch, Tim. <laughs> Mike Mitchell, the cornerback, was totally beaten there. First and goal for Jacksonville. Straight man-to-man -man defense. Watch the top of your screen. Perry Kemp, 85. And a straight man against Mike Mitchell, 35. He runs the inside route. See the safety checkup? Luther Bradley stayed short. Sipe read it. And what a great catch by Kemp. Oh. Rozier and Mason, the setbacks on first and goal. 7-0, Houston leading. Touchdown, Rozier, markers fly. And it appears, at least for the moment, that Jacksonville is the guilty party. Gary Anderson, 60, shaking his head, so. Now, they had Marvin Lewis just inserted into the game, and he was the motion back. There's Anderson, the guy that moved prematurely. So they did have three backs in there offensively. What you do with that motion back is try to take one linebacker and get his attention. If you get him to move or take his eye off either one of the setbacks, then you've accomplished your job with that little reverse motion there. And he doesn't get involved in that goal line dive or whatever. Now they've got uh, backed up to the about the six yard line, makes it a little tougher. Still first down. Crease, but Hosea Taylor and Van Hughes got there to stymie Rozier as he was headed for the end zone. How many times did you see Mike Rozier do this exact same play at Nebraska? There's the lead block by 32 Mason, and then Rozier right off of his block down to the two-yard line. I'll bet he ran, he runs that play in his sleep because that one is the bread and butter play for the Nebraska Cornhuskers. And now that Mike's playing professional football. They've installed the same kind of running play. 66 is up. Now here's the great passing situation. You've got two downs to run it in, or you can run the little play action, Tim. Second and goal. Premature movement again in the offensive forward wall. Seventy-nine, A.V. Richards. Richards, the tackle, or Turner, the guard. We're having difficulty with our microphone. I read his lips, Tim. <laughs> 79, he said. <laughs> the microphone is provided by the Astrodome. Not by ESPN, but we've got a lip syncer up here for an analyst, so no problem. Hey, now, 79 is easy. You get into those 50 <laughs> numbers, and I'm in trouble. <laughs> At any rate, second down and seven yards to go with the ball at the seven, and the Bulls have had difficulty since that catch by Kemp that, in essence, could have been a touchdown had the throw been a bit more shallow from Sutton. They'll take it, though, Kemp. Crunch. Pete Payton. Peyton constructs remote-controlled cars and helicopters. Nothing remote, though, about this meeting between <laughs> this guy and this guy. Brian Seip, well, first of all, you give all the credit to the secondary people for Houston. They had everybody covered. And if you uh, keep the quarterback in the pocket for five seconds, one of those defensive linemen is going to meet up with him. 
Third down and goal now from the 12. Well, if you're going to throw, and that was the philosophy last time, this only gives you that much more room. Pressure's on sight now. He's got to find a receiver quickly. They're going to come after him and play straight man to man. Matthews at the top of your screen. Incomplete. Alton Alexis, the intended receiver. Will Lewis was there to provide the coverage at its field goal time for the Bulls. Houston secondary kind of sucked it up after they got beat on that long bomb and did an outstanding job. First of all, the penalty is what killed them. You get a great back like Rozier, second and two from the two, you ought to be able to get it in. But the five-yard penalty now puts you in that territory where you've got to use your passing game, too, and Houston took advantage of it. Brian Franco has not missed from this range. 29 yards away, Swagger will hold. He got it. We have a timeout at the Astrodome in Houston. The Bulls are a bit more bullish. They trail Houston 7-3. Star State, Tim Brando and Mike Hafner with you on ESPN. The Jacksonville Bulls trailing the Houston Gamblers by a score of 7-3. to three. Brian Franco with the field goal. Just uh, 20 seconds left here in the first quarter. A quarter that has moved along because of a couple of drives by the Houston offense, which was killed by an interception. And then what could have been a touchdown drive that was killed by a penalty by Jacksonville. Speaking of penalties, there's another one. Ball's out of bounds on the 11 yard line. Now they have a choice. They can take it after 30 or they can take the five yard penalty and then Brian Franco will have to kick it again. Now, you know what happens if they kick it out of bounds again? Then you can take it at the 40 or you can take a five yard penalty and make him kick it again. If I'm Houston, and I've already seen what my punt return team did. Make them kick it every yes. single time, Tim. You're absolutely right. Now, you get Verdan and McNeil and all that speed. Tommy Myers will not return to the game. Now, the ice there is on his neck. He had a concussion a week ago and even took cortisone shots in his head. Now, is that a tough guy or what? That's tough. That's a tough, tough guy. Anybody that plays 13 years back there at free safety has got to be tough. Puts a lot of pressure on now, though, with Brian Seip, the way he reads defenses. Yes. It's the free safety that keys that secondary, and now you're going to have to come in with a youngster who doesn't have Tommy's experience, and we'll see if Brian can exploit that. He already got one deep route on it. Back deep is Clarence Verdan. You just saw him there. That's Corbin. Up to the 22. Derek Baptiste made the stop for Jacksonville. Makes him look bad, right? Could have taken it at the 30 instead of kicking it off again. Franco really drilled that one down the one, though. He may have gotten angry. <laughs> because that was really one of those proverbial sky kicks that you used to see in the college game when it became popular. And you know, you know what happens. That's the kicker looking up to see who's going to block him, and he forgot to <laughs> keep his head down to the ball. Kelly already a pretty good night, though, is only incompletion was an interception and that cost his team a touchdown even still his club leads seven to three here in houston houston a 49 yard putt return from gerald mcneil a 29 yard field goal by brian franco for jacksonville at seven three as the second quarter begins johnson first down joe johnson made the stop of Richard Johnson, but not before a first down had been picked up. Take a look at the coverage here, and if you can see zone defense like I can, there's the safety up on one side, the three deep, not really man-to-man, -man, and you cannot run zone consistently against a run and shoot, or they will eat you for dinner. <laughs> Unless you've got the greatest pass rush in the world, and I know Millard's a heck of a pass rusher, but he can't do it every down. That's Millard, number 93 on first and 10. That's Millard that got to Kelly. Markers are down. The ball is loose. And they're going to say that he was in the forward motion. With a red flag. Holding is the preliminary indication that we get against Houston. Now, we'll just wait and see what's 
the officials meet and talk about this one. Defense jumped outside, holding on the offense. It's all academic. We mentioned Millard. Here he is. 73, Keith Millard, the great pass rusher. Number 71, Rob Taylor, who uh, was meditating in his locker before the game, saying, I've got to block this guy all night. That's holding, folks. That's, that's as good as you can get. Got to hold a handful of jersey. That's the most pulling of a jersey I've seen since the track, uh, truck and tractor pull pulled into the Astrodome. Is that why they call him Taylor? <laughs> he knows good fabric? You bet. <laughs> First down and 10 with the ball at the 44. We start all over again. <laughs> Kelly dances and prances to midfield. He gets six. Johnson made the stop. There are two ways to stop the run and shoot. One, you cover man-to-man -man on all four wide receivers. Two, you get on the quarterback as quick as you can. And this big man, I mean, he weighs 275 pounds and he runs like a running back. And the reason Kelly had to get out of the backfield was that big number 93 was bearing down on him. And I've got a feeling Kelly has got a third set of eyes in the one side of his helmet so he can watch that guy all night. Second down and four with Johnson in motion for the gamblers. They're going to rule him down in the grasp of Bob Nelson back at the Houston 40, and it's not a popular decision. If you really want to be technical, Tim, you'd call him for intentional grounding. If, if, in fact, he was in the grasp, then he shouldn't have thrown the football. 21 sacks for the Bulls this year. They'll need many more tonight. That's the way to stop Kelly. Get on him quickly so that he hasn't got time for his receivers to make his read. And then Jim's got to make his reads on top of it. And if there's somebody standing on his toes, it makes it tough. With that loss, it's now third and 14. We should anticipate another change made defensively here by the Bulls, I would suspect. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't play zone defense here. I'd gamble on getting to Kelly and playing the guys man to man so they don't run that crossing pattern in the seams of the zone to kill him. From this vantage point, he seems less than a yard away. Joe Johnson made the tackle for the Bulls. Good call, third and 12. And a bad call if you're the Bulls fan, because roughing the pass took place as well. Tack a few more onto that healthy gain. And the gambler's drive will be sustained. Kelly's got a smile on his face. I got a feeling maybe he thinks he got away with something. Here's Millard on Taylor. Runs right by him, and there comes Class B on the other side. Uh, it was Carter. I take that back. And Sal Carter out of Notre Dame. The rookie that really is a great pass rusher, and that's one of the reasons why he, along with Millard, are the guys to watch defensively for Jacksonville. Now, they don't run the football very much in Houston, so you're going to be pass rushing most of the night. First and 10 with the ball at the 33. Just underway, second quarter. Fowler inside the 30, down to the 27. Tom Dinkle, the left outside linebacker, made the stop for Jacksonville. In talking with John Jenkins, the offensive coordinator of Houston, that's a new wrinkle that he put in since Miles Davis has gone up to Denver. He said, we only used to throw to the backs when we got into our goal line situation. He said, now it's opened up in the field. There's, uh, there's John Jenkins, the offensive coordinator. And he said, you know what, Mike? Mouse picked it up for me. And yesterday, Billy Johnson made a key first down at the end of the game, if you saw it, on that same exact play. That's what you call a high-profile assistant coach. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Second and five. Fowler. Nelson was there, not fooled at all. Bob Nelson to make the stop, and it'll be third down, and still about four yards to go for the first down. Call it a long three, perhaps. One of the disappointing things for the Houston offense this year has been their lack of a running game. Harrell's been banged up a little bit, and of course we talked about Fowler and wearing the knee brace, and he's got the knee problems coming into this season. But if the run and shoot is going to really work effectively, you've got to have the running back that threatens the linebackers occasionally. They know you're going to throw every down. You can be a lot tougher on defense. Third and three at the 25. 
Verdad. Or I beg your pardon, McNeil. And the big hello came from Donald Dykes, the right cornerback. Perfect defensive call by Jimmy Johnson. He's got Dykes rolling up in the zone defense to his side, which means he has no deep responsibility. He can take the chance on this little quick screen outside. And Dykes, I'm sure he was drooling, saying, oh, I guessed right. Fourth down and five with the ball at the 27. A little discussion, not the great debate that we had last time when Houston was in scoring territory before they opted to go for it and then later settled for the interception. Not so, much, not so much, I think, the debate on whether they should have gone for it, but whether they should have punted it or not, because this is really on the borderline of Fritch's uh, distance. All right, we'll see what the toe of Tony has in store. They'll mark it at the 34. It'll be a 44-yard attempt. Myers is back in the game to hold. <laughs> Tony will tell you if it's good. The great chef has come through with three more for Houston. I said Tony's range is 45 yards. Anything over that, Tony's got trouble. And I'll tell you what, he was just inside it. He got it. Watch the reaction. He's an institution. And the gambler is becoming an institution, leading by seven right now. Entertaining to this point, the Houston Gamblers lead the Jacksonville Bulls by a score of 10 to 3 with 9.53 left here in the second quarter. Tim Brando and Mike Hafner with you. Frank Corral warming up his right foot. Back deep, Reggie Butts and Perry Kemp. It will come down. out of bounds at the 20-yard line. Aubrey Matthews, rather than Kemp bringing it up the field, down at the 20-yard line. Just beyond the 20 to the 21 is well their market. Carl Allen made the stop for the Gamblers as Brian Seip comes back out. Seip, three of six, 66 yards. That one bomb to Alton Alexis has got to raise his confidence a bit. Even though you separate the other shoulder, Tim, it's really painful coming back. When you throw across the body, boy, it opens up that left shoulder, makes it, you gotta be a tough dude to handle that kind of pain. Mason goes split wide to the top of your screen. You see his shoot there at the top. One setback, and that's Rozier. Mason, the intended receiver as well, and that one was blanketed by Andy Hawkins. Hawkins played with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for a, a year or two in 1980-81. Now teams up with his brother. Sipe last week, as we mentioned, really the reason why he garnered the start. You look at, at Luther's numbers, and they're the kind of numbers that most starting quarterbacks might have in this sure. league. Except for the interception stat, and uh, that's the reason Lindy made the, the, the change. Can't turn the ball over, especially against Houston with their offense. Second and ten. Rozier tried to go where there was room. There was none there either. Hosea Taylor, Van Hughes, plugging the hole along with Derwood Rockmore, who just came into the game to replace free safety Tommy Myers. If you're going to run inside, you got to block the two inside guys, Hughes and Taylor. And they had a little switch up there. Mike Rozier had no place to go. Even though Sipes given him every opportunity, Tim, he's throwing on first down when most linebackers play run. And he's running on second down when most linebackers play pass. And you give Rozier every opportunity to gain some yards. That time, the defense had the right scheme. Third and long has been a difficult uh, down for the Jacksonville offense to this juncture. Third and 11 here at the 20. Deep Caton again. He made the move over Bob Gruber, the left tackle, and sacked Sight inside the 15-yard line. 77 Pete Caton, all USFL last year. Just 6'2 and 242 pounds, but just flat speed, Tim. And I think the National Football League as well as the USFL are changing to the smaller outside guys with great speed 
because the passing game has taken over professional football. Fourth down and 18. Slider to punt. McNeil back deep in almost the same position he was in when he came up with the 49-yard punt return in the first quarter. He's standing at his own 46. I think about kicking it out of bounds here. <laughs> He thought about it, and he just uh, did it, and he got a nice roll to go along with it. We mentioned good numbers with the exception of interceptions, but well, you, you have to think that this guy's career has been behind the proverbial eight ball under Dan Fouts, now under Brian Seip, who still has, you have to think, a few years left. First and ten, the gamblers are running and they're shooting right now. Chester G were there, but not before McNeil did the flying Walinda act right here. One of the things that really drive defensive backs crazy is when a speed receiver is running at you, and then the doggone quarterback throws it short. I mean, you're running to save your life so he doesn't get behind you, and then Jim Kelly throws it short, and you get the easy catch. Look at this. Dykes and G are running like mad the other way, and McNeil, all he has to do is slow down, catch the football. Drives defensive backs crazy. He's garnering some points for most valuable player in the gambler locker room after this one's over, at least for the moment. Johnson in motion on first and ten. Johnson was thinking out and up. The pass went out and incomplete. There's one of the reads in the run and shoot. You, you read the linebacker. If he forces, you turn up field. If he drops off, you stay in your swing pattern. Johnson ran the right route. Jim Kelly read it wrong. That's all right. He can have a few mistakes a game the way he's producing. It's amazing. If I had a quarterback up here, I wonder if he'd see it differently. He would have. <laughs> hey, well, us old receivers stick together. Yeah. Uh, Kelly will tell you afterwards, I threw it away because he would have picked it up. Yeah. Corval in the game. He's at the top of your screen. Second down and 10 with the ball at the 15 of Jacksonville. Johnson touchdown. Inside the 20 yard line, the run and shoot is limited. You can't run the deep route. But Johnson in motion here has run this pattern at least 80 times in his two year career in the USFL. And Kelly's hit him a number of times for touchdowns. What you do is you flood the right side of the field, then bring the lone receiver, Johnson, back across the field, and it's very difficult for a defensive back to cover a motion receiver out of the backfield. Johnson was going to his left, then he comes back across the field, and you always get one or two steps on the defensive back. Kelly makes the great throw, and he's got six. Just over halfway done in the second quarter. Frisch in the tack on the point. They say you have to hold this team down in the first half. Jacksonville has to do better in the last 651. That NFL fishing tournament, I know that you'll be interested in that one, Mike, on the Colorado River. You've done plenty of that. Oh, yeah. And PKA Karate coming your way from Lake Charles, Louisiana, all here on your source for sports. Turn, tackle made by Threadgill. Reggie Butts, the receiver there, up to the 20-yard line. That's what you call gambler ball control. <laughs> 104 off the clock, three plays, 62 yards. Thank you. Johnson with the touchdown pass. Anything under a minute is normal run and shoot. Anything <laughs> over a minute, ball control. Uh, now, Brian Sipes got the pressure on him now, Tim. He has to show his defense something, which means he's got to hold on to the football, and he's got to maintain the confidence of his offense by getting some first down. In the game at tight end is Norris Brown. He's in the slot, goes in motion. Rozier. Bradley got him. Might have had a bit of his headgear, though there was no flag. Gain of about four. We'll call it second and six coming up. One of the things you'll notice about Rozier is his strength. And anytime anyone talks about a Nebraska football player 
former Nebraska football player. Uh, you'll talk about his strength. Just 35 yards away from 1,000 on the year. Well, and you know, there was such question about his ability after last season with Pittsburgh. That was a tough situation in Pittsburgh with the Maulers. Second down and six with the ball at the 24. Jacksonville trailing 17 to three. Pass intended for Alton. Alexis was a bit behind him. Will Lewis was there to cover. Third and six coming up. Remember Brian Seip last week came in in what we call garbage time a little bit. Their team was getting beat, so he came in in the second half. And he's still a little bit rusty. He leads Alexis a little bit more here, and he's got a completion. Good job by Will Lewis, though. Mason has come out of the game. Aubrey Matthews has joined forces with the Bulls. An extra receiver in the game. That's Matthews that goes into the slot. I'd like to see him use Rozier as a pass receiver here. Right on, coach. Rozier, but not enough for the first down. Adrian Simpson, quarterback. In that nickel deployment, made the stop. Fourth down and three, so they got half of it. Something, though, for the Houston defense to think about now for the rest of the game. Rozier almost got the foul. Well, he, was, he was a lot shorter than I thought. Rozier, many thought, would not be a good pass catcher in this league, or any league for that matter, until Lindy and Fadi found out otherwise. Now you got to find out about those Nebraska tailbacks. The only thing they ever caught was the pitch back on the sweep. <laughs> Larry Swider will put it away. There's Gerald McNeil. He has been dynamite tonight. This is one of the times where the Swider didn't even want to come on the field. Yeah. <laughs> Can destroy your punting average when you know a guy back, back, back there like that. Fair catch is called for and taken at the 38-yard line. And it will be first down and 10 for the Gamblers when we return. 17 to 3 Houston here at the Dome at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. on the West Coast. Memphis takes on Portland. The Showboats may be the toughest team in this league right now off their past few performances. Dick Corey still searching for some offense in the Pacific Northwest. First and 10 with the ball at the 38. Houston up by 14. Verdan knocked out of bounds at the 44. Gain of seven, second and three. John Jenkins got knocked right on his hind end, the offensive coordinator, and he's the one that calls the play, so he's got nobody to blame but himself for getting <laughs> run over. <laughs> There's John. He's up smiling. He's okay. That's all right, John. Put your headset back on. You'll be all right. Uh, you know you got to take the heat from the players when that happens. I hope he didn't get sh too shaken so he couldn't call the next play. That's right. Remember, he was off headset for a while, so if we have a busted play, we'll know why. Just shy of the 45, second down and three. Kelly has plenty of time. Nice coverage by Chester G. The pass was intended for Verdan again. Don't give Kelly time, but Chester G., Read it all the way. Got one hand in there, and Verdan couldn't hold on. Millard and Taylor are really going after it, but did you see that quick inside move for a 275-pound defensive end? He's got some speed. They've already lost part of their offensive line, or at least an abbreviated portion. Chris Ream is gone for the night with a sprained right arch. So they had to move Tommy Robinson from right guard to right tackle, and then they bring in 60 Scott Boucher to play the right guard spot. Boucher in his third year out of Northeast Louisiana University. Gee, don't I know somebody who went there? Yeah, great school. Yeah, Tim Lib Brando. Liberal Arts School. <laughs> <laughs> Little quick hit. Not a bad choice to Scott McGee. Inside the 50 to the 48, Joe Johnson made the stop. Scott McGee, man after my own heart. The possession receiver, they call him. You know why they call him possession receivers? So they don't have to call him slow. <laughs> That's what I was for all my career. Hey, he's a great possession receiver. That means he can't break four, six in the quarter. 
Although I think Scotty's a little faster than that. They have collectively come up with so much talent that they couldn't keep it off. You look faster even if you're pretty slow. That's right. And these receivers on your team. First down and 10, Houston. They lead 17 to 3 from the dome. There he is again. A possession receiver with a big play. Scott McGee finally hauled to the ground by Donald Dykes. You can talk about Johnson with his speed, and you can talk about McNeil with his, and Verdan with his, and on and on. But quarterbacks tend to look for guys when they get in trouble who have the great hands that'll make the tough catch. Here's one up over McGee's head, and you'll just see it at the bottom. Hands first, then brings it into his chest. Hey, he makes a pretty good little move there. I like that. Jacksonville brought a linebacker that time, Tom Dinkle. He just missed Kelly. Otherwise, it would have been a big loss. First and ten at the 30 of Jacksonville. Harrell. That's five more. Costello made the stop. Joe Costello. Harrell has got great talent, and you have to wonder how he must feel knowing that Fowler's getting more playing time because of his injury he sustained. Well, every time you get hurt, you start looking over your shoulder for that young rookie that's going to take your spot, and you may never get it back. Harrell broke his leg, of course, last uh, last season, yep. and that's when Fowler got his chance. And, of course, he opened up against Chicago last year with 202 yards. Second down and six. Fowler is back in the game now. That's Johnson in motion to the top of your screen. Fowler comes right in and makes something happen. Van Jakes made the tackle. I think they're going to measure... I don't know whether he gave him the spot enough for a first down or not. It looks a bit short. But then again, I'm just the announcer. <laughs> I guessed last week I gave it up. Did you? After that, I gave up. Old special teamers are supposed to know whether it's fourth down or third down. <laughs> I've always said I had few senses, but that one was okay. Yes. At least for now, it's okay. And it will be third down in less than a yard. Now, here's a situation where the gamblers could have a little fun. Up by 14. 17-3, and they've been accused of being vicious on offense. They never give up. They never quit. They never try stop trying to score on you. Sure, I'd run, I'd run a little run and shoot here. You can always pick up the first down. They got it. They didn't listen to you. Now, but they did get the first down. They're being nice to Lindy and Fondy and the Bulls in the first half. They don't want to get them mad. Ball is spotted at the 18-yard line when we return. It's 17 to three, Houston. For a bunch early, you lose your confidence. You can't use all the change-up defenses. You try, you start panicking on Jimmy Johnson's side, trying to find the right combination to stop him. And the offense isn't producing either. In motion is Verdan. Kelly was blitzed big time from Bob Clasby along with Baptiste. Nickelback situation, and they decide instead of covering the receivers that they're going to blitz. Yep. And they send the cornerback and the safety, the nickelback really in this situation, 28 Derek Baptiste, and he didn't have a chance. Jim Kelly said, let me get out of here and we'll go to second down. Now here is where the Memphis Showboats went to school on the run and shoot. Inside the 20 yard line, Pepper Rogers' club was pretty tough. Yeah, you take away that deep ball because there's no room to run and you can pretty much choke it up on the inside in the slot back. Second down and 10. Same play again, Tim. Tried it again, it didn't work. And Baptiste was in on the contact again, the pass falling harmlessly away from Ricky Sanders, the intended receiver. You look at him facially, and I tell you, that's a, that's a young Archie Manning. Now, they don't resemble one another in the way they quarterback. Archie, of course, more of a rollout, but you, that, that is Archie Manning under that headgear. Looks just about like him. Leads the United States Football League in so many categories. In everything. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's incredible. He would lead a lot of leagues. Oh, yeah. He would lead a lot of careers. Third down and 10 with the ball at the 17. 152 left in the half. Oh, 
available option. Poor decision there. Harrell makes good use of the AstroTurf hop. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but I think I saw a marker fly as well. Keith Millard botched that play defensively. You know who's most upset about this play? If the, the penalty uh, goes against Houston, which it will. 65. Oh, they declined it. You know who's mad now? Tony Fritch. Just a little option play, and I've got a feeling that maybe that shot that John Jenkins took on the sidelines caused this play. I don't, I don't understand this one here. If I were Kelly, I'd have pitched it right away. Then he makes the poorer decision of pitching it late. And Harrell did the smart thing. Get the ball first, then get out of bounds, and we'll worry about it later. And to make matters worse, what you didn't see there was a holding call against Dan Rosado, the right guard. So... Uh-oh, Tony's right at his distance, 45 yards. Here we go again. And he'll let us know if he makes it or not. <laughs> Myers again will hold. Premature movement by the snapper that time. Now they're, now they're out of Tony's range. Carl Allen is the, the center. And I believe it was Allen that moved in a hurry deep snaps. Now, you're right, that would really move Tony into the danger zone. Another thing, too, is it puts him in the dirt portion. And I would, in this situation, I'd either let Corral kick it, I'd go for the first down, or I'd punt it. Let's see which one uh, Part D takes. I think I'd go for the first down. Why not? Because I see that guy coming in. <laughs> That's smart. <laughs> That's the first time I've seen the run-and-shoot quarterback wave the white towel. Fourth and 21. That's the first time I've seen anybody go for it on 4th and 21 that was ahead. <laughs> Behind, maybe. Well, the, the events of the last couple of moments might have saved the Jacksonville Bulls for the remainder of this game because had they scored another touchdown here, perhaps even three, would have made it that difficult for the Jacksonville Bulls in the second half. That's a pretty elite company for a quarterback as young as Jim Kelly. Hey, he's only had... He's, He's had a year and a half. Marino's had two. Montana's had significantly more. Kenny Anderson's been around for ages. Now the argument there would be, oh well, that's that's those are NFL guys. Well, oh. Maybe a, there's a couple of USFL guys there. 21. Erdan. He's short. Not enough. But a good try, and it's as good as a poor punt. Donald Dykes made the stop of Gerald McNeil rather than Verdan. You give Kelly time, and again, they're playing zone defense. They don't want the 20-yard pass. They'll give up the 15-yard pass because they know it's fourth down. And there you see Donald Dykes coming up to make the tackle. Let's see what Jimmy Kelly thinks about it. First of all, he's thankful there's no rush. Yes, I completed it. Look at him run to see if he got up for enough yardage. Ah, doggone it. But it's as good as a punt. It's inside the 20-yard line. Gerald McNeil added to his stats, so he doesn't mind. <laughs> First and 10 with the ball at the 15. Jacksonville owns it with a minute 40 to play. Well, they're not going to play it conservative down by 14, are they? Van Hughes had the pressure on Brian Sipe. And you saw Sipe's reaction right there. He tried to get out of the way of the rush and complete the crossing pattern. And he just didn't have the quickness to get out of the way. Still a little rusty, and you can see it from being off for those 12 weeks. That's a long time to be away from it and then come in with so much riding in the season. They are 6-6. Six and six. Now Remember, Baltimore is now 6-6-1 six, six and one off their win against Orlando. I was there for that one on Friday, and it didn't come easily for the Stars. tight end has got it. That's a first down. Luther Bradley finally made the tackle. Andy Hawkins was also around the play. First down will stop the clock, Tim, and I don't think uh, Sipe will take a timeout. He'll just hurry up here. 126 is left. The ball just shy of the 30-yard line. Matthews is in the game. Now he's down there at the bottom of your screen. Field goal here would really help the emotional side. 
<laughs> Speaking of emotion, how about Hughes? Bursting through to stop Sipe in his tracks back at the 20. Again, they've been effectively blocking the outside pass rushers, Clasby and Millard, but all of a sudden, hey, Brian, in. they can't block the inside people of Houston. Van Hughes and Hosea Taylor have been standing on Sipe's toes all, all evening. That's a ton from Southwest Texas <laughs> in his third season. Second down and 20 yards to go. some pressure and finds his tight end again. Keel back to the original line of scrimmage. Andy Hawkins got him out of bounds. And it will be third and ten. Or check that third and about 11 or 12. But the scenario remains the same with 52 seconds left in the half. Even a field goal here and with three timeouts left it's possible. Not, it's not impossible would really aid the cause of the Bulls in the second half. It did help them that they stopped Houston on the drive, kept points off the board, but they need to, need to have something to live with when they go in at halftime about the offense, and so far they've done nothing. They really need more out of Rozier offensively. The cadence might have caused Houston to come offside. Sipe finds his man. That's Alton Alexis at about the 35. As we mentioned, though, markers are down. Tempers are also beginning to flare between Hawkins and Perry Kemp and a few others. That surprised me a little bit. I thought the 12-year veteran at quarterback would uh, go downfield. He knew he had a free play. He got in the offside because of the staggered count, as you mentioned, Tim. And I thought he'd go down and try and stick one in where you normally wouldn't do it, knowing that you're going to get the ball back anyway if you make a mistake. Especially when you consider that he didn't throw for first down yard. That's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, you can heave it for the, the long ball, but sure. at least throw it beyond the 11 or 12 yard range. Quarterbacks love those free plays. <laughs> you mean I can throw an interception without getting in trouble with the coach? Well, boy, am I going to throw it here. Try to make a great throw or have somebody make a great catch. He's not thinking about box scores right now. Trailing by 14. Third down and six. A good thought and a good first down call. Linebackers were coming. Diella made the stop along with Mike Mitchell. Now there's a play that the Houston defense did not work against. Mason is not known for his pass receiving. Aubrey Matthews in the slot. Intended for Keel. Now that's been complete a couple of times, and they just caught Luther Bradley for pass interference. It would have been completed a third time had not Luther had held on to the jersey of uh, Keel. Again, a handful of that nice fabric. Our officials tonight: Earl Sagren is the referee. The umpire is John Bradley. Here's a look at Keel and why he didn't catch the football. See the backside hand? You try to hide that from the line judge. But all, all good back judges will see you sneak that little hand around the corner and grab a handful of jerseys. I always screamed they did that to me. The line judge, Stephen Morehouse, caught it. The headlinesman is Roger McMinn. Ken Henry is the back judge. The side judge is Willie Spencer. The field judge, Grover Klimmer. You know what they always said to me? They say, you haven't got enough speed to get away from them anyway, so don't complain about it. <laughs> First and 10, the ball at the 38. The blitz is on. Coming from the corner was Adrian Simpson. Larry Mason, the intended receiver. Second and 10 coming up. 27 seconds left in the half. Simpson was in the dime back situation. That's when they bring in six defensive backs. He was the sixth. And he really plays in the linebacker spot. He'll either drop off play underneath coverage or he'll blitz. And in that situation, Sipe almost ate him for a halftime snack. Time is running out here in the first half. 17 to 3, Gamblers over Jacksonville. The Bulls are on the move here inside the 40 yard line at the 38. Sipe. 
underthrown intended for Matthews. Simpson was with him and may be the guilty party here in a big, big call of pass interference. The pass was underthrown. Now there are two factors here, Tim. Pass one. interference, number 21 defense, 15 yards. One, what was was the pass catchable? I don't know if it was catchable. Two, does the defensive back have as much right to the path of the ball as the receiver? Absolutely. Oh, first of all, it's not catchable. I'll tell you, I've got to be down the field and watch it a lot more closely well, than that to make a decision. But first of all, I don't think it was catchable. Wes Parker might have caught it <laughs> on the short hop at Chavez Ravine. Oh, well, you know what it does now. Puts him in that field goal range, and the old veteran quarterback, Brian Seip, has done exactly what he had to do. And, and they also have 19 seconds left. So time to do some things. And speaking of getting things done, Herschel Walker continuing to get the job done. He's having to earn his yardage. He did yesterday. Didn't get a win with all those pretty numbers, though, but this guy did. Bill Johnson, 98 yards. And only the second rusher in this league. And uh, they use him in so many ways, Mouse Davis does. Cliff Stout, now against Los Angeles, he and came up with a lot of yards. Field day. Perhaps the biggest part of that, five touchdowns. Chuck Clanton, 13 interceptions in one season with the United States Football League. That's a record. You know whose record he breaks? He's right out here on the field. He played for Arizona last year. Now, number 27, Luther Bradley, who had 12 last season. There you see. Throw the crossing pattern, try to stick it in there. You'll throw the outside route, or the deep route, so you can throw it out of the end zone. So you leave your field goal kicker at least the bottom line chance for three. At the 23, first and 10. Intercepted by Bradley. Matthews, the intended receiver, and Seif did just what you mentioned he should stay away from. Bad throw, Tim. Terrible throw. You don't throw the ball over the middle and give the defense an opportunity to pick it off. Silly throw, and isn't it surprising? We were just talking about Bradley, who had his record broken in interceptions. He just picked off his 10th of the year, which is number one in the Western Conference. And you see the mistake. If you're throwing, you can't see the blind side. And if somebody comes across the middle that you don't see, it's an automatic intercept. And I'll tell you what, they'll go into the locker room now with their tail between their legs, where they could have been on an emotional high with a field goal. Now, does the run and shoot ever sit? No. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised to see him throw it here, although he should hand it off. Harold takes the seat. But they didn't just uh, sit on it. That's the end of the first half. Tom Meese is coming up with the men in halftime report. And we'll tell you, we still have a good one underway at the Astrodome. Frank Corral will kick off. Reggie Butts and Terry Kemp are back deep. Way back into the end zone. They'll kick it around and bring it out to the 20-yard line. And that's why Frank Corral was signed and Dale Walters is somewhere else. <laughs> That's collecting unemployment. One of the big weaknesses for Houston in the last six weeks were their kickoffs. They were always giving the other team great field position. And so they made the change. Frank Corral puts it in the end zone now and takes the pressure off Tony. So he didn't have to kick off. Sipe and his offense. Again, we set them. Pennison is the center with Turner and Anderson, the guards. Richards and Gruber, the tackles. Keel, the tight end. Alexis Kemp are your wide receivers, Alton Alexis and Perry Kemp. Rozier and Mason are in the backfield. Start out with three wide receivers, so Infani's made a change already. Mason is in the slot. In essence, another receiver there. Rozier stopped. No change, though, defensively by Houston and Van Hughes. Rayford Cooks, the defensive end, also in on the pile. Hughes has been a factor already in the first half. He might be the defensive star so far for Houston. He's been putting a lot of pressure on a lot of people. These stars defensively for the Gamblers are all from obscure colleges in big states. Caton out of Eastern Illinois. Van Hughes from Southwest Texas State. 
Cooks out of North Texas State. They're bigger and better in Texas, even though they come from smaller schools, aren't they? Second and nine. Broken up nicely by linebacker Andy Hawkins, Mark Keel, the intended receiver. And it'll be third down and nine coming up. Caton again with great pressure on site. This is a defense that has been thought by many to be suspect. They have left little for the critics to chew about tonight. <laughs> I would imagine the offense of Jacksonville has a bit more respect oh, right yeah. now. And Fonny certainly thought they were a better defense than many had given him credit for. Maybe he knew the weaknesses on offense and couldn't exploit the Houston defensive deficiencies. They aren't the fastest, nor the strongest, nor the biggest. Third and nine at the 21. The Bulls need desperately to make something happen here. With the aid of Kiki Diallo, they may have gotten some help. That site makes his way up for a couple of yards, but again, markers are down. That's one good thing for the Houston defenders. Offside. If you have, and we'll listen, defense. we saw it, it was very plain that Kiki was offside. But if you're going to score that quickly and that often, you can take a whole lot of chances on defense. So what if you get burned? Give up 14 points, the offense will get you 28. So you can take a lot more chances on defense when your offense is the run and shoot than if you have a plotting type possession offense uh, that a lot of teams have. So uh, maybe you can make better athletes on defense because of the offensive scheme. Third down and four at the 26 yard line. Jacksonville trailing 17 to three. 13 minutes and 45 seconds left in the third quarter. Tim Brando and Mike Hafner with you on ESPN. We're happy you joined us for Monday night USFL action. There's Rozier in the pattern we talked about at the end of the first half. Up to the 35-yard line he goes. Derwood Rockmore and Adrian Simpson made the stop for the Gamblers. Now that you've discovered the fact that Rozier can catch the football, you got to throw it to him once in a while. Here's a crucial third down play, and we've been asking for this one all night, and they finally threw it in a situation where it could become productive, and Rozier gets the first down, as we said at the opening of this second half, Tim. If the Jacksonville Bulls don't prove something on offense in this drive, the game could be over right now. And the theory has to be, let's score and pile up as many as we can because we know they're going to score sooner or later. The ball's at the 35. First down for Brian Suck and company. There's Rozier. Up to the 48-yard line. Derwin Rockmore made the stop. Said that Mike Rozier was a great inside runner. This is where he made the Heisman Trophy yards when he was at Nebraska. And if you give him a crack, he's got the great upper body speed. Most people think that great sprinters have the great legs and the strong, powerful legs. But if you're strong upstairs, you can get that extra tenth of a second. Plus, if you're a running back in professional football, you can take the ball a little easier from those linebackers when you're strong. Marvin Lewis, his third year out of Tulane, is now in the backfield along with Rozier. He too a good pass catcher. Sight with a double pump incomplete. And Marker's down again, kept the receiver almost the same situation. The pass underthrown and Mike Mitchell, the cornerback that's going to be caught, it appears. Oh, Mitchell's having a tough night. They're picking on him, he feels like anyway. Pass interference, number 35, defense. You can be the guy in the striped shirts now. We'll take it from the end zone view so that you can watch if there's any bumping going on. Oh, yes. Impeded his ability to get to where the ball was. A perfect call. Right arm forcing him to the outside. You've got to let him have his route to the ball just as the re offensive receiver has to have allow the right of the defensive back to get to the ball. And Mitchell was called for the right call at the right time. Mike Mitchell out of Howard Payne feels more pain as we speak. First and <laughs> 10 with the ball at the 47 of Houston. Rozier the lone setback. There he goes. Tripp got up, went again, and got inside the 35 to the 33. Sherwood Rockmore again on the file. And we've got some fisticuffs. Will Lewis and Alton Alexis. 
couple of uh, Walter weights going at it <laughs> on this, the near sidelines. Is, th is this the all-time uh, two personal fouls on each guy? Personal foul, unnecessary roughness, number 89. Personal foul, unnecessary roughness, number 24. Penalty canceled. Why, why, why even throw the flag then? Yeah. Lewis. Yeah, he started it. They're pointing at each other going, I didn't do it, he did it. I didn't do it, he did it. Don't even throw the flag there. Just break it up and say, gentlemen, this is a football game, not a boxing match, and get on with the game. Besides two little wide receivers, defensive back fight <laughs> is no big deal. Second down at six, the ball at the 33. Now, while the crowd is growing shorter and shorter of patience with the gambler's defense and the officials, the Bulls are moving forward right now. Rozier again finds the crease. Luther Bradley might have saved the touchdown along with Mike Mitchell at about the 21-yard line, but Rozier was kicked in on all cylinders that time. One of the things that all the scouts say about Mike Rozier is his quick feet. Look, at he was stopped right there. And in order to get over three yards to find the hole, you've got to have tremendous lateral quickness. And that's what they say is such an impress, impressive job by him. And look at Diallo. I mean, he falls for the inside move. And then Diallo gets blocked because Rozier can move back to the outside and find the hole. He has quick feet, Tim. At the 21-yard line, the Bulls have the first down. This drive got underway at their 20. For Alton Alexis, touchdown. He beat Will Lewis and says, take that. <laughs> After the little altercation, Alexis comes out the winner. And that's exactly what Brian Seif needed. He needed that long drive. They were down 17-3 coming out of the locker room. And now they've reproved in themselves that the offensive game plan they put together all week against Houston is a viable one. And they can stay in this game. Alexis runs a great route. It was just one-on-one. -on -one. All he had to do was lay it in there, and Rayford Cooks made him pay for it. But quarterbacks don't hurt so bad when they're laying on the ground after they've thrown a touchdown as you would hurt when you got the incompletion. Brian Franco for the point. And we've got a timeout with 10 minutes and 6 seconds left to go in the third quarter. Inch closer. Why is everybody in the place holding their breath? <laughs> That's Verdun. Clarence Verdun up to the 20 yard line. Mike Whiting made the stop for Jacksonville. The scoring drive, perfect for Jacksonville fans. And as you mentioned at the outset, they had to get Rozier into the offense, and they did a couple of times. Ran the ball well. Caught the ball out of the backfield for the, on the crucial third down plays and set up that that corner route by Alton Alexis for the touchdown because now the Houston defense had to be concentrating on Mike Rozier. Kelly with another night at the office, 14 of 19, 200 plus yards and 30 minutes play. got it and out of bounds at the 24-yard line. Joe Costello, the right outside linebacker from Central Connecticut, made the stop. Joe will soon be marrying one of the cheerleaders for the Jacksonville Bulls. Now, you got to believe that he has to take a little bit of the heat from the uh, players on his sidelines for <laughs> Yeah, I imagine he gets ripped pretty good yeah. in the locker room. What have you been doing, uh, Mr. Costello? Keep your mind on the game, Joe. <laughs> right? Second down and eight. Gain of only two on the pass to Verdan. Intercepted. Derek Baptiste inside the 20 to the 18. Markers down. The tackle was made by the center, Billy Kidd. Billy might have broken the wall. Bad read by Jim Kelly that time. They had the five defensive backs in. Batiste is the nickelback. And Kelly threw it right into coverage. Kelly read it wrong. The defense guessed right. And the flag is on the Houston Gamblers for piling on afterwards. Brian Seitz is going to get great field position, Tim. Does he ever? Just what the doctor has ordered for the Bulls here. 
Watch the three white shirts around the receiver. <laughs> I mean, they had no chance of getting that ball to McGee. Batiste. Oh, Kelly tries to make the tackle and gets shot. There's the late hit by Billy Kidd, 61. It'll cost him another half the distance to the goal. So the ball now at the nine for the Jacksonville offense. It's already 17 to 10. Mike Rozier certainly you'd have to think would be a part of that nine yards and he only needs six of those to become a 1,000 yard rusher this year. The third one. You're right. Johnson's already in, isn't it? He got it down to the five. Van Hughes made the tackle. Talk about an all-purpose running back, and Rozier is certainly one of those, but Johnson out of Denver is something else. Oh, he's a fine player. And when you play the single back, you've got to have a versatile type back. Here's Rozier on the inside run. You've seen him try the sweeps, but you've seen him catch the football, and I think that's his biggest asset now. It'll open up the running hole for him down the road. You'll be seeing the second 1,000-yard rusher very soon here on ESPN in the upcoming week. Second down and goal from the five. Sight incomplete. Alexis, the intended receiver in his old nemesis, Will Lewis, gave him an extra shove or two in the end zone. The the toughest, yeah, the toughest drive in football is first and goal at the nine. You either got to throw all three downs, hope you can fool them on a running play. And now they come up with third and five. And Tim, this is the toughest passing down in football. You haven't got any, you can't run any of your receivers deep. They've only got 15 yards, the 10 in the end zone. And so you've either got to fool them or you got to pick them. <laughs> and the old screen play in basketball works every once in a while if you can get away with it. Uh, we've got one of the better pickers in professional football annals at the helm right now. Third and goal. To Mason. Can he get there? Yes. Touchdown, Jacksonville. Adrian Simpson was in hot pursuit. He had some help. Luther Bradley and Andy Hawkins. And there's the exclamation point being given by Mason. Remember the uh, crucial third down pass that they threw to Mason earlier on the drive at the end of the half? Here's the exact same play. They're not used to seeing Mason out of the backfield. And I've got a feeling that number 21, Adrian Simpson, blew a coverage. Wasn't thinking about Mason coming out of the backfield. By the time he realized it, it was too late. And Sipe, the old veteran, found it. Mason had to turn on the afterburners to get there, so give him respect for his 40-yard dash. Right now, we're tied at 17. Brian Sipe has his club searched eyes here. He's reading the defense to see if he's got Adrian Simpson inside or not. And as soon as he reads it, he knows that Mason has got a chance to get the corner of the end zone. And the old Wiley veteran just picked apart the Houston defense to tie it up 17-17. We got a game, Tim. You get the feeling that Seif uh, has gotten sweet revenge from what happened at the end of the first half. Yep. Franco's kick coming down to Verdan at his four. Boy, he's in a heap of trouble right now and gets away from it. Look at this. Out of bounds at the 25. Now, they'll mark it right there, and markers are going down. They're exchanging verbiage again. Joe Johnson made the stop. Chris Wampler right now. And Young and a few others from Houston are talking, exchanging hellos and goodbyes. But they mark it at the 25, but that was a great return for just the ball. Just 25 just, yards. For the ball just making it to the 25. That was personal foul. Number 68 of the kicking team, personal foul, number 24 of the receiving team, penalty canceled. Sanders goes in motion again. <laughs> Kelly got away from Millard, but not from Curtis Anderson. Curtis Anderson from a little central state in his fifth season. Seeing time along with Bob Clasby at the left defensive end. Bulls defensive coordinators gone with four down linemen here. And Millard really made the play because Kelly got stalled, couldn't find an open receiver, and then Curtis Anderson came in and mopped up. Millard's been a load tonight. He and Rob Taylor really going at it. 
Well, they've taken out Vaughn Jackson. Vaughn Johnson now the linebacker brought in the extra down lineman again. It's a five man front in essence now for Jacksonville on third and 13 and six DB. That one was knocked away. Mansell Carter was in on it. Somebody got their hand on it. Perhaps it was Curtis Anderson and it's fourth down and it'll be a punt formation for the Houston Gamblers and it's pretty obvious now that the pendulum has swung the Bulls way because the offense has produced on their last two drives. Now Jimmy Johnson's defense has got some extra incentive knowing that the, de the offense could pick it up for him if they make a mistake and they've been uh, the better defensive team in the second half. Now Corral will earn his money for the first time since re-entering the Gamblers organization in the punt formation. Reggie Butts is back deep. I beg your pardon, Perry Kemp, and Perry will let it roll out of bounds at the 40-yard line. First down and 10 for the Jacksonville Bulls when we return to the Astrodome. We're all tied at 17. Live USFL football coming your way on May 25th. That's Saturday. Memphis and Portland, and what a game that one ought to be. As we mentioned earlier, they just are so tough. Oh, Memphis, some kind of, they're playing as well as anybody in the league right now. There's more than steam coming from Pepper Rogers' head yeah. right now. Ask Houston. Yeah. <laughs> His numbers have uh, moved up quite a bit in this game off the last drive. Going a little over 50% right now when you consider the ratio. At his own 40-yard line now. That's the tight end again. this play a few times tonight. It gets about three. This Second down and eight. They only gave him credit for two yards. Sipe has got some room here. First down to the 27-yard line of Houston. There's the savvy of Brian Sipe that we mentioned at the outset. Not much room, if any, for Rozier. Hughes made the stop. secondary direct everybody you're right the ball is now at the 27 Rozier nice move inside the 25 to the 23 he left Kiki Diella uh, back on first base and was headed for home still shy of the first down there's Tommy Myers Hey, it makes a difference when that old veteran back there who has seen seen it all, you can't fool him. Now you take him out, and those youngsters with three and four years experience are looking over their shoulder saying, Tom, where are you? I need some help. That guy is one of the most loved human oh, yeah. beings in New Orleans and in football. Saints fans, though, they remember him so well from that one in 15 year when he was the leading tackler on the club <laughs> at the strong safety. Third down and five. Rozier the lone setback. has plenty of time. Under duress, he finally gets it away. Rayford Cooks, who is in hot pursuit, finally got a hand on him. Maybe not from 50. Swatter will hold. is limping and he might get another chance. Or it will be an automatic first down. That's right. 59. Running into the kicker. He still might get another chance if his team doesn't come through. Any defensive penalty is an automatic first down, even though it was fourth and about five and a quarter inch, right. five yards and a quarter inch. It'll be an automatic first down and, oh, that's a bad break for the gamblers. Let's see how they rough Franco. Watch number 10. Got his head down. And this is why they protect kickers. He can't see anybody coming at him. Standing there and then gets rolled into. 
59, Andy Hawkins. Let's see if Hawkins gets blocked into it. Nope, he just tried to block it and then took the feet out from under Franco and he limped around. And I don't know if, if Brian would have been ready to kick another field goal, but it doesn't make any difference. They got a first down. The crowd's reacting, seeing him fly through the air with the greatest of ease right into Franco, but they don't realize that he was not blocked at all to go into that somersault job. First and 10, the ball at the 18. The gamblers right now are taking chances they needn't take. Just over two minutes to play in the third quarter. Play fake. Heal the intended receiver. I know the folks at home couldn't see it, but Alton Alexis was standing in the back of the end zone with nobody from 15 yards around him. If Sipe could have signed, it would have been an easy score. Luther Bradley there providing the coverage against Keel, the tight end. Keel was questionable coming into the game out of Arizona. They had been using Robert Young and Norris Brown. A great deal of tight end. And Lindy and Fonny said if he couldn't play, I'll go with four wide receivers. And he has played three a lot in this half. The injuries have taken their toll. That's why we're in week 13. You expect that. Second and 10 at the 18 for Jacksonville. Matthews in motion to the top of your screen. Flags are down. Alexis incomplete. Will Lewis was covering, but that one was into and out of the hands of Alton Alexis. An opportunistic type of game, and Brian Franco's toe right now the difference. 20 to 17, Jacksonville. The upstarts here. We're at the Astrodome in Houston, Texas. Tim Brando and Mike Hafner with you on ESPN. We're glad you joined us. It's been living up to the proverbial billing to this point. Right straight up the gap. Goes Vince Corville. Making the stop was Phil Forney for Jacksonville. So Corville gets it out to about the 27, where it'll be first and 10. Tim Brando and Mike Hafner with you as we start action here in the fourth quarter. Look on the scoreboard and see who's behind. Third down and 19. Richard Johnson up to about the 32 and 33 yard line. Ben Jakes knocked him off his feet. And it's punt time. Ran a double screen there and tried to fake him out by faking the screen to 46, Todd Fowler. And then coming back, but the uh, Jacksonville defense didn't buy a lick of it. Well, if you're a Gamblers fan, you've got to be a, a little concerned about what's happened with your club in recent weeks. Yes, Memphis is a great team, and you played well, and you made the errors, and they took advantage, and you were on the road. But this has not been the kind of second half that you would expect from this kind of team at home. Corral the punt. Woo. Harry Kemp on his heels. He got away from Verdan. Markers are down. Finally making the stop was Reggie Bonner. A strong safety that also sees a little time at the linebacker spot from time to time. He drilled that punt. That was 55 yards plus. I'd say that's a good acquisition for Jack Pardee. Earlier on the return. Illegal block in the back. Number 96 of the return team. Half the distance to the goal line. That will put the Jacksonville Bulls on their patio, but right now they are in control of this game. Though they will be inside the 10 at about the seven yard line. 96 gets the call. Right across the back. Oh, <laughs> post him in the back. Rookie Mansell Carter. Got to learn not to do that, son. 20 to 17, our score, Jacksonville. The Jacksonville Bulls with the ball at their seven yard line and leading 20 to 17. Now they were down 17 to three at halftime. 17 points they scored in the third quarter. All points unanswered. Rozier. Rozier gets four, so following J.T. Turner. Mike Hawkins made the stop, the linebacker on the left side. 
Take a look now at Turner and Richards paving the way for the 83 Heisman Trophy winner. A little misdirection in the backfield, so it gives time for the right side of the line to pull. Turner gets a nice lead block, but Hawkins, and that's Mike Hawkins, not Andy. Andy got blocked. Mike was there to pick it up. And the speed of the Houston linebackers makes a difference on the sweep. Well, Lindy and Fani has made all the right choices to this point in the second half. Second down and eight. Rozier. The good running backs can do that. Luther Bradley finally made the stop, but about two or three other guys had an opportunity before Rozier picked up the first down. Good example of the quick feet there. You're stopped dead. Two steps later, he's at full speed again and picks up the first down yard. It's interesting that uh, Lindy and Fadi has got a possession football team right now. When, when it, at Tulane, when he was an assistant to Larry Smith, he was given all the credit for the wide open nature of that Tulane team that made it to a couple of bowl games. The difference between wide open and possession is that you can throw the bomb every once in a while and be successful, and he hadn't done that here until the second quarter, uh, second half. Throws here, once again, eludes a few would-be tacklers, and finally gets away from Moore. He's running like a man possessed right now. Derwin Rockmore made the stop. He ran right over Mike Mitchell and right by Pete Caton a couple of times. That was a beauty for that guy right there. You want to see where the weight training pays off? Watch Mike Rozier. First, you got to be a great athlete to stop and make that kind of turn. Now, here comes the strength. First of all, he takes a blow up around the shoulders, and it doesn't even phase it. Catches back, and he turns upfield, and then finally gets knocked off his feet. But you can't tackle Mike Rozier high. He's just too strong. He's getting a well-deserved blow right now. At the 30, first down. Alexis incomplete. Lewis with some aid from Dennis Devon. Mike got popped in the nose, I think. Uh-oh. Did he break it? Won't stop him. He has been banged up all year long. He's been playing with Cass on both arms. All kinds of physical problems, so it's not been easy for him. And we should mention that Lad Herzeg and the Oiler organization had an opportunity to get him. And of course didn't. This club did, and Herzeg met with Rozier's agent today. He'll be a free agent at the end of the year. Second down and ten. Five men front now for Houston. Marvin Lewis the single setback. That's complete. Robert Young, the tight end from Bethune Cookman, made the catch. Just at the top of your screen, Norris Brown is the tight end in the slot right. First and ten at the 42. Marvin Lewis gets the call. Lewis up near midfield. Rockmore made the stop. Marvin getting big cheers from <laughs> the sidelines. They know Rozier's out and taking a blow, and he comes in, makes a great run. Lewis, an interesting study, was drafted by the New Orleans Saints of the National Football League, an all-purpose guy, was finally cut in his second season. We've got a three-point lead. Three points isn't enough against the Houston Gamblers and their offense. Well, remember now, there's, but, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a guy who uh, could get you three yards on third and three, <laughs> Larry Zonka, player personnel director and the general manager. And uh, still a pretty good neck size. <laughs> That's the size 50 coat. He looks like he's still playing. Yeah, he does. A lot of I would, DBs don't want to tackle I'll him. I'll tell you what, I would not tell him he couldn't. <laughs> Second and three. Just shy of midfield. Marvin Lewis has the first down. Hawkins. Mike Hawkins on the stop. There's a look at Lewis. This guy has got enormous potential, and everyone in the Bulls organization would tell you that because he does have that versatility. 
right now he's picked up enough yards to uh, keep that clock running and get first downs and that's exactly what the Bulls want to do if you've got it the run and shoot has it <laughs> and if you've got the lead that's the right place to be well we said the the key number for Jacksonville offensively would be 30 they're 10 away from that little little fun time here Sipe throws and they don't give him credit for the reception. Perry Kemp, the intended Although he has made the correct calls from time to time. Second and 10, and there he goes. There's that experience again. Down to the 42-yard line before Kiki Deella made the stop. He's definitely not a runner, though, is he? But there were no receivers open that time. That's Matthews in motion. And Alexis. Swatter says, well, we'll have none of that. I'll just put it in the end zone, and you can start from the 20-yard line. 20 to 17 is our score. Jacksonville leading. They had 17. Gamblers fans are on their feet, urging on their run and shoot. Their team down 20 to 17. Jim Brando and Mike Hafner with you. Kelly. Nice stiff arm job to get rid of Bob Nelson, but then he ran into Joe Costello. Back at about the 15, call it the 16-yard line. No way to start for Jim Kelly and his offense. Again, great pressure by the front five. They got five down linemen in there, and Jimmy Johnson, the coordinator for the Jacksonville Bulls, has found the secret. Put pressure on Kelly, keep him on the ground, and the run and shoot offense doesn't function. Millard got a piece of him as well. There you see the sex. Jacksonville has had enough to be in the game right now. They certainly are in that position, leading by three, aren't they? McNeil, they'll give him credit for the reception at the 30. Donald Dykes was there to make the stop. It's a first down, Houston. They went to four down linemen that time, didn't get the pressure on Kelly. Now you gotta have two feet down in professional football. One, ooh, and now see this, the line judge is right there. If he can't see it, nobody can. So we're gonna have to say that he's right. And it sure looked close. Scott McGee coming to the bottom of your screen. That's horrible to the top. Where Dan is the slot back at the lower portion. Richard Johnson at the top. Where Dan goes in motion and markers are down. Incomplete intended for Verdan. That's right. You saved him enough in the first half. That's true. That's I right. could read his lips in the first half. Second <laughs> half is worth perfect. Second and ten at the 31. An intense face. On Johnson running, running him out of bounds. But another first down for Houston. The new twist to the run and shoot, throw it to the back out of the backfield. We saw it yesterday if you watched Denver against uh, New Jersey. Billy Johnson had a couple of key receptions, and we've seen it once to Todd Fowler today on a or this evening on a third and six where he got the first down. Here, second and ten. They go to the back out of the backfield, and it's a new twist to the run and shoot. They didn't throw to the back except down in the goal line in the prior year. Horrible at the top of your screen on first and ten. McNeil at the 38 with Donald Dykes atop him. And another Houston first down. Jacksonville now with the lead. You can see the zone defense, see the three deep, and then the underneath coverage. And if you continue to run zone against Jim Kelly and his receivers, he's going to march it right down the field on you. Six minutes and 20 seconds are now left in counting. He's got to have three, and he'd love to have seven. Todd Fowler out of the backfield. He's close to a first down, hit and fumble. Ball is loose, Costello hit it. And they're giving it to Jacksonville. 
Beeson got it. Terry Beeson, the linebacker. Again, not a popular call where the locals are concerned, but here it is. Again, the back out of the backfield. Kelly reads it correctly. Fowler's wide open. Now he's going to try to get a little bit of extra effort to get the first down, and he's going to get the ball ripped out as he falls right there. Excellent job by Beeson. He's the one who made the hit and then made the fumble recovery. Our score is Jacksonville 20 and Houston 17. Win a prize. Yes, in Denver. Yeah. First down and 10. Rozier gets a yard. Mike Hawkins plugs the hole. 528 left. Now, Jacksonville is in one of those catch-22s here offensively, aren't they? That's right. You want to keep it on the ground to keep the clock running. You don't want to have to put it up because if you throw an incomplete pass, the clock stops. But Lindy and Fonny wants three plays with a minimum of three yards. And they got two there. That's not too bad, and the clock's still running. So he's right so far. Barry Kemp moving into the slot. Alton Alexis wide to the top of your screen on second and nine. Tip drill nearly, nearly gave Houston a big, big chance. Luther Bradley made the hit, and Kiki Diala had a chance. A big chance. He wanted to throw the back outside, and again, Brian got in trouble. Remember at the end of the second, uh, at the end of the first half, he tried to throw one over the middle. It got tipped and picked up. Kiki Diala almost had the right reaction time. But there's the key. 447 to go. And third down and nine. Rozier coming out of the game. Mason is now the single setback. You think they'll pass rush here? <laughs> I would. <laughs> here they come. It was tipped in the air by an oncoming defender. Will Lewis was the cornerback that was coming through on the blitz. McNeil does have room this time. He gets it to the 25. Takes it in and dropped by McGee. To go on fourth down, you would think. Five-man rush. McGee, first down. Arrell dropped it, and he had plenty of room. Footsteps. Da -da 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 -da. And those <laughs> footsteps belong to cornerback Van. This guy in this league is the guy that can do it. Second and ten. Incomplete. Old overshot. McGee at the top with Verdan in motion. Nearly picked off. McNeil oh. slipped. Donald Dykes nearly came up with the interception. Oh. Kelly is trapped. And it's all over. Bob Nelson got to him. And the party is on in Florida. One minute and six seconds are left. And is that a happy guy right there, Lindy and Bonnie? namely Baltimore. Yes. Who would have jumped ahead and been in the eighth playoff position. But there's still some weeks remaining. Well, the one thing about both divisions is that the leaders have got to play each other. Somebody's going to knock off somebody. And uh, more wins for Houston throughout the rest of their schedule uh, will make the difference and not this long. Well, there they are, seven and six. Four teams with one game between them. They're separating. And Baltimore is right there. Only Orlando is out of it. And in the West, Houston now behind Oakland and Denver. And it really is a three-team race, and all three of those teams will go in. 
Oh, and you yeah. would think they would anyway. Yeah, unless there's a collapse by any one of the three. And as well as all the Eastern Conference teams. Remember, the first two in each conference make it to the playoffs. And then the four best records after that. And uh, those four best records right at this moment happen to be over in the other league. <laughs> Big, big win for Brian Sipe, and does Lindy Infante look like the prophet now, choosing the steady veteran who had those great years in the National Football League with the Cleveland Browns. Lindy Infante, of course, getting much of his reputation with Paul Brown, Cincinnati Bengals, while under Forrest Gregg that Super Bowl season, had an opportunity to take a head coaching job at Tulane at the collegiate level where he had been successful as an assistant coach and has opted for the USFL and for now that and the rest of his decisions tonight have been right on target stick with the veteran uh, he could have very easily pulled Brian Seip at the after the first half performance he was absolutely non-productive but he didn't and guess what he came out the second half two touchdown drives put him back into this football game and uh, he was the difference an interception by Seip for Sipe at the end of the half, and then an interception for Kelly at the beginning of the half really turned the tables in this game. It's all over.